Check out the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, available on iTunes, Google Play Music for Android users, on the web through Podbean, and via YouTube. I mean, 20 years is nothing, is it? I mean, look at him. He doesn't look a day over 25. Well, I'll see. So. Um, so how did you guys come to the program? I think a lucky stroke by uh, Walking Shaw. Uh, now, I think it was, was quite, uh, quite special because uh, I was already with, uh, with Jaguar for a couple of years. So, uh, you know, already a little bit uh, familiar with sports car racing since uh, 83. So I was doing it for like five years. But Andy was, was driving these, these nimble Formula 3 cars in, uh, in England and then all of a sudden he was uh, uh, called up like, uh, can, you join, uh, can you join us for, uh, for Le Mans? And there he was, you know, in a car that was covered and a completely new experience and a completely new track and Le Mans is nothing like, I mean, you get used to, to Monaco probably in two laps and, and in Le Mans probably after 20 laps. So, uh, yeah, I don't know how that, that came across for Andy. But well, no, it's... it's yeah, exactly as Jan had said, and in fact at Macau in November in '86, we'd raced together in Formula Three. Because you know, there's the end of season Macau Grand Prix. Did you have to ring that up? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my memory escapes me on who out of us two won that race. But, um, I think uh, um, we both won because we? Uh, you we won the race and my best friend won the race, so that was pretty good. Oh, that's right. So kind of you, right? So there we go. <laughs> Don't cry. But, <laughs> But actually, it was uh, tables completely turned when when it came to the Group C race because because I knew nothing about sports car racing at all apart from coming three times with my father um, on one of these twenty pound coach trips from London uh, to you know to stay up all night and watch the cars go around. It, it was a real thrill to do it, but I had to key off of Yan and uh, Johnny Dumfries was our teammate. Johnny and Yan were driving all years, as Yan said, but Yan was very much the team leader. And what he had to do, of course, was trust that I wasn't going to throw it in the hedge. And, and the other way around, actually, Yan taught me an awful lot of things. You know, seriously, there are a lot of things that I still use now in 24-hour races. Um, you know, stupid things like don't eat this, don't drink that, don't do this, don't hit that slow car. But also things about keeping the car, keeping the momentum, make the car fast, but don't, don't destroy the car. And uh, I honestly think he's going to blush a little bit. Well, you can't tell because he's so suntan now. But, um, <laughs> Without Yan in the car, that, that win couldn't have occurred with that car because it, you know, it just finished the race, just, it just did enough to win the 24 hours. For those that uh, maybe are new to sports car racing or weren't fortunate enough to, uh, to see the win, maybe take us back to the car. Let's start with the car. Tell people about uh, the beautiful, glorious sounding and looking Jaguar. What, uh, what, was a, what was it about that car back then that worked so well uh, and was able to be so competitive between a rather large V12 engine sitting over yeah. over your shoulders in the back. Everything about it was glorious. Yeah, I think it was actually um, uh, a, a lot of compliments you 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 ought to give to 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 many people. Um, uh, you know, maybe maybe uh, first of all Tom Walker Show who sort of initiated the project and uh, and I don't know. I think he first initiated it and then later got Jaguar on board. Uh, it would probably be one of those. So that's an enormous risk and commitment. Um, and it was uh, done on the basis of, uh, of like a, a regular engine. It was not a race spec built, so it came from, from basically a road car engine. Uh, that task was given to Tony Southgate to, to sort of like uh, design a car around that engine. Um, so I think, you know, both from, from Walkinshaw, from Tony Southgate, and, uh, and then I think Alan Scott, uh, to, to prepare that engine um, mm -hmm. and, and with Charlie Bamber and, and uh, you know that team did, did just a tremendous job to, to just make such a package which was actually uh, able to beat a company as large as, uh, and as compet uh, competitive as Porsche. And you mentioned to me last year uh, in terms of understanding the differences between eras and the cars uh, you've been driving a LMP2 car for uh, a little while now and you'd mentioned kind of missing the days of just monstrous power and at a track like this where back in 88 a different configuration those straights were something very serious maybe tell us a little bit about what it was like to or the two of you tell us about driving the, that car and what it was like uh the speeds the power the handling maybe also compare it to uh what you guys are driving today i think first of all you know as jan said before i jumped out of a formula three car into uh, group c jaguar and then to come to le mans with that straight three and a half miles long 
you sit there for something like 50 seconds with your foot nailed to the bulkhead. And in a racing car, that's extremely unusual. I mean, 10 seconds is unusual. So you sit there and everything is flashing past you so fast. And for a Formula 3 driver, it's a bit of a bit of a ride. Eyes out on stalks. Um, and it's, it's not something that you normally would do. And we were doing speeds around 240 miles an hour. But it's uh, 250, yeah, I think 248, Depending on the yeah. wind, I think. We were just over 400 k's. And yeah, then, I think so. And with a Formula 3 car, I'm over 230, I think. Yeah? Uh, Macau, yeah, Macau probably, but everywhere else, much less than that. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, it's a, it's a big change. And also, the car's quite big. Um, it, the straight, on the straight, it looks, if you watch on the TV, I've seen some of the video footage, it looks like the car just wander very slightly. But from inside the car, it was wandering a lot more than that. It was having a bit of a swerve up everywhere. And Yan would say things like, well, just, just, you just let the car do what it wants to do. It's like towing a caravan in a crosswind, you know, just, just let it do its thing. And certainly for, for me, I drove the f car first of all at Port Ricard for a test before Le Mans. And Port Ricard has a relatively long straight tour. And that was the first time I'd been over 200 miles an hour in a racing car. And it's, it, it does it, it opens your eyes and, and you think, right, okay, I could really seriously have a big accident in this one. Whereas in a Formula 3 car, it's always just a pretend accident. So it, it's, there's an awful lot to learn for, for a new driver. And I notice that now because since then, of course, I've driven at Le Mans every year, bar one, and I think Yann has too. And I've driven with much less experienced drivers than myself now. I'm finding myself as the one who's teaching the younger guys how to do it. And that's exactly what Yann did. But he did such a good job that when I was out there, I was never wondering what I should do next. You know, if I had a question, I would ask Yann. And, uh, straight away yeah well just do this just do that what are you doing that for you idiot it's this way <laughs> and uh and it's pretty good and and one of the things of course we had an old h pattern gearbox uh, and you know we haven't had those now for what ages and ages and ages yeah. and ages i can't remember the last time so but every single gear change is, is down to you if you don't put the clutch in at the right time do everything in synchronization you can you can destroy the gearbox so Jan was banging on about how important it was to change gear properly change gear properly change gear properly of course now it's all done with uh, pneumatics you just pull paddles behind the wheel mm -hmm. the driver can't make a difference of whether the gearbox breaks breaks or not we, we so actually we actually agreed between each other that we weren't going to finish the race and it was because the gearbox broke and uh, then we all sort of like started the race being aware that once you're, you're, you lose second gear or third gear, then you have to shift around that problem and then you become very, very strict. So that's why we started the race bearing that in mind. So we said we are not going to finish the race because the gearbox breaks. So therefore every gear shift had to be as if you were giving points for it. And, uh, and now you couldn't break a gearbox even if you wanted to. Uh, the brakes last the whole race. The gearbox is just like you. You flash, uh, you know, you flash the lights or you you wash the windows, and and uh, you know, and and the tires. You can do three or four stints. Uh, you know, that's that's all uh, a lot different. I remember uh, the '88 race for being one where the commentators were constantly speaking about Yui and just kind of the legend of Ian Lammers coming to life in a car that, as you mentioned, you could not abuse to make it go fast. Yet yeah. you were able to hustle that car while having to be delicate as well. What was it like making that car go as fast as you did while having to take care at the same time? It's a great challenge. Yeah, but you know, at the same time, it's, it's you know, it wasn't it wasn't sort of uh, a matter of, 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 of me telling the guys what to do, you know. I mean, Le Mans, it says more for Le Mans than, than something for me. It is just like Le Mans is all about sharing and it's about giving. Uh, so, so first of all, you have to put your ego on in the wardrobe and just pick it up on Monday, you know, providing you have one at all. But, uh, you know, you, you just have to give the car back as good as you can give it back. And you have to give all the information uh, and whether that is that is whether you bring tablets for, 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 for hay fever from, from the pharmacy or whether you tell people how to, uh, not how to take a corner, but you share it. You say like, well, I did do this and I had this result, how about you? What did you see at the end of that corner? And, and then we sort of like, the communication was completely like spirit level. And uh, you know, Johnny Dumfries, which, which I have a lot of best friends, but, but Johnny's definitely, uh, you know, just, just in, yeah, it's just wonderful how we, uh, how we still sort of like stayed uh, very, very good friends because it's something you also share afterwards. But uh, like I say, it's just a m more representative for, for what you should do in Lamar rather than what I did in Lamar. Maybe tell us a little bit about the race itself. It wasn't, it wasn't without drama. 
Uh, it was definitely not something where you just simply cruise to the win. Uh, you had great factory opposition from Porsche. Uh, maybe share some stories about the race itself, because it was 24 hours of trying hard. Well, one of the things that I remember most of all was the Jaguar had less drag than the Porsche, but also a little bit less power. And what's quite staggering was coming out of Tepe Rouge onto the straight, and you would perhaps have the factory Porsche behind you. After a few hundred meters out of the straight, he would pull out of the slipstream and, and tow past you. But after a while, you got used to that because as he went past you on the straight, you could wave at him. And as soon as he went back in front, <laughs> halfway down the straight, of course, he'd hit the, the wall of drag yeah. and you'd pull out and you go back past and you'd wave back past again. Only this time, they, they were always telling me there was one lap to go when, oh. I, when I passed him, when he waved back. I'm not quite sure what that was all about. But uh, it, was, it was amazing to do that. So it, an incredible race. There's nowhere else I know any track anywhere in the world where you would do a double pass like that on the straight. What still rings in my mind is, is the, the Andy's reaction, you know, after uh, after he first drove the car in the race, when he got out, he thought like, you know, he got in the car and then he sort of, uh, um, yeah, I don't know where it was, but on his first lap, um, that's what he told me afterwards, on the first lap, he sort of realized like, okay, here I am. Leading Le Mans, here is every every opportunity to make a complete screw up of my whole CV <laughs> and of my career. And mm. I, I tell you to just think back, even as you get older, and when you see even young Formula Three drivers now, there wouldn't be a team like Peugeot or or Audi who would just put somebody from a Formula Three bang in 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 you know a top team like that. So. You know, it it was really incredible that uh, that he managed to do the job, and and I remember he was outstanding in the rain, really. You know, standing his his, uh, his man, or uh, you know, really doing his job. And uh, and you know, with with Johnny too, uh, we were all in a different uh, stage of our lives then. You know, so so with different uh, things to to deal with. And uh, I think how we managed to inspire each other, because whatever. I managed to do there was because of the environment I was able to do it and they were part of that environment so uh, you know I, I would leave the, the ball in the middle you know and not shove it around who did what because you know whatever they guys uh, those guys got out of me and and what we managed to get out of the total program was was just representative for the team atmosphere when someone wins the Indy 500 they are referred to for the rest of their lives as Indy 500 winner such and such it's a uh, the title of distinction mm. uh, with the two of you having won Le Mans rel you know young in your careers um, to me the same uh, the same title comes with uh, 24 Le Mans winner Andy Wallace or Ian Lammers. What has that meant to you? How has it impacted your career both uh, positively and just that sense of pride maybe uh, from, from earning that victory? Well, I don't think anything bad ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, no, nothing bad comes of winning Le Mans. It is really something and as you say, it's on your CV for forever. Um, the, only, the only thing that is a bit hurtful, I must say, is that uh, you spend maybe three or four hours uh, winning Indy, and then you have, uh, I think the latest score was two and a half million. I think, what did you get, two and a half thousand pounds? <laughs> Something like that. I think that's what we got. You're still getting paid, right? They're coming in installments to you? <laughs> no, it would be nice if there would be royalties on the win, so uh, it's, it's uh, we would, uh, would you trade Indy for that? No, maybe not. If you could have both now, <laughs> yes. that would be good. What, um, did, uh, what did that win in 1988 do for the two of you in terms of your careers, maybe, and opportunities uh, going forward? Well, I, every time I called somebody, it wasn't Andy who anymore. It was like, oh, Andy Lammers, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, uh, you know, suddenly people knew who you were. and, and uh, Because Formula 3, especially... You know, you're in your own little world as you do Formula Three, and you, you know, you think people are noticing what's going on, but actually, you know, much, much less so than they would do, it, obviously, at Le Mans. So no, it was a, it was a big deal. And in fact, from then we drove together. Well, we've driven together a lot of times since yeah. then at Daytona. We won Daytona together, uh, 1990. It's yeah, it's it's very nice because uh, a lot of times, uh, sort of like like uh, Andy would 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 go to another team, and then he would sort of like. Uh, drag me in there <laughs> and uh, you know so in, at, at Toyota I think he uh, he mentioned my name you know and and uh, I ended up driving there and then later you know with 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 his in-laws in the meanwhile uh, with the Crawfords uh, you know I've uh, I've joined the Crawford team which was uh, really wonderful you know gave me a lot of great opportunities to drive with great names there in Daytona and other races 
so that was nice so so whenever and wherever you know even Andy uh, raced for us with racing for Holland um, you know so so uh, whenever there is an opportunity to to sort of like uh, yeah do each other a favor or you know just just uh, advise the team that uh, we could do a sensible job we won't hesitate to do that maybe tell me a little bit about uh, winning for Jaguar Jag bring, delivering that win which I remember at the time was although there were other things that happened in motor racing in 1988 I don't think I remember anything but uh, Jaguar's first victory in, in many many years mm -hmm. what did that mean to you to you too what reaction did you get from the fans I mean especially I would imagine for you as well Andy being uh, from the home of Jaguar probably had some extra meaning the whole thing for me kicked off before the race started when you just came to the track for the first time and you saw all the all the fans everywhere and it was very much a, a Porsche versus Jaguar so Germany versus England if you like and you especially walking on the grid before the race started that there wasn't a single space anywhere in the grandstand it's just full of flags waving everywhere you, you could feel the importance of it all um, and then as Jan said when I when I actually left the pits for the first time and I was leading the race you've got all these outside influences coming into the car and then it suddenly dawns on you okay you've actually got to drive this car and, and bring it back in the lead with no nothing wrong with the gearbox and, and everything and I'd already promised myself that if I did make a complete mess up of the whole thing and crash it in the wall I was going to leap over the wall <laughs> find some taxi driver somewhere and get him to take me back home because if I came back to the paddock if I wasn't lynched by Tom Walkinshaw I'd, there'd be some Jaguar fan somewhere who'd rip my head off and so there's, yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> there's one, there's one fan yeah. that we, that and most people around him will never forget. There was the guy that was naked on the grandstand. Oh he yes, was just holding a <laughs> holding a Porsche flag in front of him. Should I ask where he was holding the Porsche flag? <laughs> no, oh, he was just he was holding, holding the, Porsche the Porsche flag in front of him, and every time we came by with the Jaguars, he lifted it up. But you can imagine how the crowd they were in stitches on the floor, oh. and uh, I think the V12 makes a lot of noise. But at some point we could hear the crowds go over it no. it's it's actually when i look back at pictures now that that i can't believe the amount of people that were there and and oh. the impact the win how they had it just gives still goosebumps on that topic what do you guys still have uh in whether it's a display case or something from uh, from those years of driver suits photos well one of the downsides uh, of getting older is that you speak more about the past than than, than uh, the future but but uh so personally, I have one nice model uh, in 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 uh, in my house back in Zandvoort. That's all I have of motor racing in the house. The rest I leave in the office because, you know, whatever pictures and memorabilia you have, it's all about the past, and and uh, we can only do what we do now and today if we live with the present and the future. You know, because you can't drive a, a car from looking in the mirror. Well, you can, but not very efficiently. <laughs> Um, mm. You know, so so you better just just face forward. And I think once we're uh, even older and grayer, you get grayer both anyway. So mm. um, uh, no, so so you know, uh, I I reserved looking back and going to the scrapbooks for maybe ten or twenty years uh, from now. If my eyes still will carry that. And actually, it's not too dissimilar for me in, in terms of I have the same model, and we went down to Johnny Dumfries' office in London. Mm. It was only last year yeah. or the year before yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to sign a few of these yeah. uh, models, and we so we all, we've all got one. Yeah. And it's uh, no, it, it's, it's got pride of place too. Uh, I've, I've got two great. sport uh, sport items in my house. That is the model from 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 uh, uh, the Jaguar number two, and uh, the one time I played soccer with Johan Cruyff, which was one of the level of Pele, our Dutch uh, hero. So that's the only two things that I think well that uh, that's very nice to have. Twenty years ago, uh, you guys raced and won Le Mans together. Um, I think it's almost as impressive that twenty years later, uh, while you've shared the win together, you've shared a great friendship that came from mm. it. That doesn't, you know, mm. that doesn't always happen with teammates, where you drive together, maybe see each other, but not a real, real strong friendship. Um, what is it about the two of you that just seems to to, to work so well? Oh, for, for me, it's been a fantastic uh, friendship. We, as you say, we've been great friends ever since, and it's. Sometimes we might not see each other for a year or eighteen months, and then next thing it's like we hadn't. You know, yeah, we've been seeing each other every week. It's yeah. it's it's absolutely fantastic, it really is. I think that's always a good good sign of good friendships, and then in motor racing you sometimes have that. I particularly have that with Andy. Like like he says, you see each other, you have, and you forget how how long it's been that you've seen each other or spoke to each other, and and it's like you saw each other at breakfast, and now you meet for lunch. You know, it's it's it's. Uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, the same thing goes for Johnny. Uh, Johnny obviously is not in motor racing anymore, 
and uh, you know it's a great shame that he's not here because we feel we talk about this we thing, but but we, let's say that we represent him. Um, but it's it's uh, even as you as you get older and older, you start to appreciate that more. Subscribe. 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 Hey, subscribe.